to welcome you to uh, the latest edition of The American Mind. We're very lucky to have with us again uh, Charles Kessler of the Claremont Institute and Ross Duto. Did I get that right, Ross? No, I mangled okay. it. <laughs> absolutely no, mangled it. It doubt it. Doubt it. Yes. Ross doubt it. Uh, of the New you York Times. You made it Times. sound better, though. I, I do my best. More poetic. <laughs> <laughs> of the New York Times and also a best selling author. We've just been treated to two takes on saving the Constitution and two different views of 2012 and what it meant for the American electorate and the prospect of a return to constitutional government. Um, but what we didn't explore in those discussions is how conservatives lost the argument in the first place. How is it that we've lost this concept of hewing to the Constitution and all of its wisdom? So. Uh, Ross, you uh, posited that it might have been uh, with the loss of the argument in the 1960s, but does it go farther back than that, Charles? Well, I mean, in a real sense, uh, we lost the, we, we've been losing the argument for 100 years. Um, modern liberalism really arose in the progressive era. That's uh, almost exactly 100 years ago. The 1912 election was when that broke into our politics. Um, the 2012 election was the fourth installment, really, of liberal um, of aggressive liberal politics. You preceded by the new freedom and the new deal and the great society. And uh, I think what Obama in the deepest sense thought he was doing in 2008 and 2012 was reviving liberalism itself. I mean, in his own, if you look at his second book, Audacity of Hope, uh, if you look at some of his speeches, it's pretty clear that he thought liberalism was in a kind of crisis. Uh, before 2008, that it had been, it had become a Me Too um, uh, movement, that it had been um, tamed by Ronald Reagan and the Reagan Revolution, and that the best it could do was the kind of triangulating politics of Bill Clinton, you know, school uniforms and tax cuts and uh, uh, NAFTA and, and sort of centrist to right uh, policies, one kind or another. Uh, but Obama denied that. Uh, he thought that Reaganism was, even as, uh, as Ross was arguing, Reaganism, Reaganism was the exception, not a new rule. And that the country had already been fundamentally transformed, uh, and it was only necessary to renew the deepest movements in American politics. And he set out to do that. He set out to inspire liberals with a belief in liberalism, again, to show them that progress in the sense of breathtaking political change was possible, to make progressives believe in progress again. And uh, all that rhetoric of 2008 would have been for, no for naught if he hadn't been able to back it up. But he was successful in the first two years of his first term in enacting the kind of marquee legislation that no liberal had been able to enact since the Great Society. Obamacare especially, but Dodd-Frank also, the stimulus bill, uh, and I think that from his own point of view, he solved the crisis of liberalism. He showed that it was not defunct, that it was very much alive and uh, could prosper again. And conservatives are dismayed because I think we, as much as many other, many liberals, um, bought into the analysis that Obama rejected. We thought that this kind of sweeping change in our politics, sudden leftward movements, were a thing of the past, that uh, you know, we had, we had um, permanently neutered the, uh, the liberal <laughs> impulse. And it turns out that that's not true. I, I, things are up for grabs now. But Ross, that's a vision of progressivism as uh, the, the, the nanny state. So conservatives lost the argument because uh, through these decades, liberals have rolled out more and more programs um, basically to help us in every sphere of our life. Is that how conservatives lost the argument? And is that a permanent loss? I mean, I think that there are there are some permanent defeats in politics, um, and I think that to the extent that you define to, to the to the extent that you define the conservative goal in terms of the politics of 1912, it is very hard to see, you know, there, not not in an ultimate sense, right? Not not in the sense that you know there there's no. There's no such thing as a you know a lost cause. What's the line? Because there's no such thing as a found cause, right? So, not the 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 fact the fact that um, of where we are today does not mean that you know the argument that 
what happened in 1912 and 1916 and so on was a mistake. This doesn't, that doesn't mean that argument necessarily goes away, but it means that in practical political terms, it is very hard to imagine within you know, the next few generations the disappearance of the welfare state. Right? I mean, and that's just a reality that you know, conservatism has to grapple with reality. That's just a reality that conservatives have to grapple with. We have the um, same institutions, the New Deal institutions. We have Right. I mean, the, you know, the, the, New, De the New Deal institutions have proven fairly durable. The great society institutions may be less durable in the long run, Medicare in particular. But even if they are less durable, the reality is that something called Medicare is still probably going to exist in 30 or 40 years. And the argument that conservatives and liberals are having is an argument about what that institution will look like, what kind of scope it will have, how much it will impact our common life, and so on. Um, and so you, you do have to, to some extent, take politics and reality as you find it when you're thinking about sort of practical political reforms and you know where, where you go from here. I, I think the issue, the issue for conservatives right now is that the, the basically the vision of the, the conservative alternative to liberalism depends on the ability of a free society with a limited government to deliver on something that resembles Franklin Roosevelt's four freedoms without being literally imposed by the state right so the idea of in order to in order to persuade people not to think of a job as a natural right you need to govern a society in such a way that most people have jobs, right? I mean, this is, this is sort of, and, and this is the success of conservatism's greatest success in our lifetimes was founded on the economic success of Reaganomics. If Reaganomics had not been an economic success, then the arguments of liberalism would have been much more powerful. And I think this, the same thing is true today. It is not sufficient to tell people that they you know, they do not have or should not think of themselves as having a right to health care in a landscape where more and more people are losing, losing the kind of health care that they took for granted over, you know, the decline, the decline and fall of the employer provided health care system, right, is one of the basic realities of American life in the early 21st century. And conservatism has to be able to address that without simply saying, you know, well, your employer's dropping your coverage, tough luck. <laughs> Healthcare wasn't a right to begin with, right? I mean, that's that, and that I think is the dilemma of conservatism. And the difference between the Reagan era and our own is that conservatism in that period was perceived as, you know, delivering broadly shared prosperity in a way that conservatism in the last 10 years, broadly shared prosperity and competent governance, right? Well, I think you both agree that the welfare state that liberalism has built is going to be very, very hard to rip down. So uh, the, the question is, how do you educate Americans um, about these conservative ideas, the constitutional ideas mm -hmm. that you've been speaking of, because they seem to be losing. Conservatives seem to be losing that argument with the young, with women, with immigrants. Charles, where do you start? Well. First of all, you start by making the argument. Uh, I think one of the problems with the 2012 campaign was that argument was really never made. Um, uh, based on the evidence of the, of, of the senses, <laughs> looking at the, at the Romney campaign, it, uh, it was not a, a deeply political campaign. It did not uh, recognize that the country was in any sense really in a crisis or was moving towards a crisis it was uh, simply a business problem that had to be solved by good Republican business-like methods. The problem was jobs. You need to create more jobs. The answer to that is a combination of tax cuts, deregulation, and uh, so forth. But there was no moral component, no constitutional political component in the highest sense uh, to that argument. Uh, and uh, Gabriel Schoenfeld may be in the audience. I'm not sure. He has a book. Uh, a very interesting book on the Romney campaign uh, now out, which uh, I think confirms that, that diagnosis from outside the campaign, which is that this was um, uh, uh, a campaign by a, a man who was really not uh, deeply political in the sense in which Ronald Reagan, let us say, was deeply political. And so he ran a relatively superficial, uh, uh, consultant-driven, uh, marketing-driven, a campaign, and he, uh, you know, rude the day. Uh, 
But but don't you think there's a sense in which the Romney campaign had the worst of both worlds, right? I mean, on the one hand, I, I agree with you. I think Romney was not, you know, was not a philosophical conservative in the sense that I think most people in this room would understand the term. And that informed, it informed both sort of his failures in speaking as a conservative and the sort of awkwardness and tone deafness with which he did it, you know, the, the going to... It was at CPAC where he no where he said I'm a severe conservative. Yes, right. You know these, yes, right. these 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 kind of phrases that you know re resemble a consultant sort That's of right. trying to awkwardly adopt the language of his clients. That's right. uh, and so he didn't he didn't have that sort of that <laughs> sort of deep Reaganite sense of what sort of philosophical constitutional conservatism really means. But at the same time, he also didn't persuade the American public that he actually had plausible. Mm -hmm. Policy plans. I mean, the, the the sort of the mantra of jobs, jobs, jobs was not actually a policy agenda. It was just right. a mantra of jobs, jobs, jobs. The economy is bad. I'm a businessman. I'm going to be able to fix it. And there was, and to the extent there was a philosophical component, it was the sort of, you know, w what Romney really believed in was business, right? And that was, I think, very clear throughout the campaign and completely understandable given his life story. But his philosophical narrative thus became the narrative just of the heroic entrepreneur, right? That was the piece of the conservative story that Romney liked, that he fastened onto, that he wanted to tell. And the problem is that, as I think Reagan, among others, understood, most Americans are not heroic entrepreneurs. They've, they love entrepreneurs, they valorize entrepreneurs, but they also respond to the language of community and solidarity that is conservative language, I think, properly understood. But if conservatives can't speak in that language, it's just, it seeds a huge amount of terrain to liberalism. So I think, I think what, you, what you want, if you're the Republican Party, is a candidate who, can, who who's combines <laughs> you know, a philosophical grounding in sort of ideas about constitutional limited government with real policy creativity, and Romney had neither. Well, before we all get too depressed about the, the, the future of the party and saving the Constitution, yeah. um, uh, Charles, we have had movements on the right with the Tea Party and on the left with yes. Occupy Wall Street that share one thing in common, uh, a great distaste for the kind of cronyism that has erupted um, because of this big government, um, for example, and ties to, to, uh, uh, to big companies. Right. So is that a reason for optimism? Well, I think the Tea Party is a reason for optimism. I mean, the only real populist movement to emerge from the Obama administration has been a right-wing populist movement of opposition uh, to Obama. Uh, and even, uh, and, and Mirabile Dictu, not only a, a populist movement whose um, whose theme was the Constitution, restoring the Constitution in some sense. Uh, the problem was the Tea Party's message, the Tea Party was not equipped to, to argue or implement its own theme. Um, I mean, the tea, after all, what is the Tea Party? The tea, I mean, the, the historical reference is not to a political party or to a movement or to a group. It's to a one-time insurrection in the Boston Harbor. The Tea Party was not the American Revolution. The Tea Party is a moment in the buildup to the American Revolution. This Tea Party, our Tea Party, we, we and they put too many expectations on. We expected them to flower into, I think, a, a movement that could, that could direct um, you know, the battle against the administrative state, the battle for constitutional liberty. And they really weren't equipped to do that. The, the, the populist side of them was uh, made that impossible, it seems to me. The Republican Party and the conservative movement should have picked up that ball and run with it. I mean, they were equipped to make the kinds of arguments that the Tea Party could only allude to, basically. Uh, but the, the Republican Party failed to do that. Um, and the conservative movement did better, but certainly did not distinguish itself, I think, in terms of seizing this as a moment precisely to talk about the Constitution, about lost liberties, uh, about what self-government uh, ought to mean, about what rights are, where they come from, and so forth. Uh, we, we bobbled the ball uh, in that case. But it doesn't mean that it's interesting that even, as it were, this late into, uh, into the process of liberalizing American government, uh, there is still a popular uh, appetite and a popular patriotism that uh, is not, has not been snuffed out.
by the state. Uh, and that gives us grounds for hope. Well, that, that's a note of optimism. Let, let's, let's continue no, and I, and with I, that. I, I, I agree with that. I mean, I think that this, the great strength of American conservatism is precisely that it's philosoph in a purely philosophical debate that did not touch on issues of policy, implementation, GDP growth, healthcare costs, and so on. Conservatism tends to win. Um, and this is why it is generally a mistake for Republican politicians to, you know, keep keep conservative ideas at too much of an arm's length. I mean, this is, you know, the the idea of sort of constitutional self-government, limited government. You know, when you poll people on the more abstract questions, they are clearly more conservative than liberal. The problem is always, you know, when the abstraction meets the reality of Medicare's popularity. Right. But Ross, let's say that Charles is correct and uh, the Republicans really fumbled the ball and they had this huge uprising in the Tea Party movement and they just missed that opportunity. Um, is this trifecta of scandals in Washington today another opportunity for the Republicans to talk about the virtues of small government returning to constitutional government? I think it is, yes. Um, I think that it is un the trick is to weave it into a story mm -hmm. that ultimately gets you this is, you know, horrible consultant speak, but get you to the kitchen table, right? <laughs> I mean, this is the, the, the challenge. I think the scandals in Washington right now make the philosophical argument for limited government just straightforwardly. That, and, and they aren't, I mean, I think the importance of them is precisely that they aren't necessarily about Obama himself. That, you know, the, the issue in the IRS scandal is precisely the unaccountability mm -hmm. of the bureaucracy rather than necessarily some Nixonian scheme directed from above. Um, and, you know, you can, you can see the same thing at work in, in the Justice Department and it's sort of, you know, I mean, the, the sort of, the, the fact that it seems like some of the Justice Department's sort of leak investigations are driven in part by sort of bureaucratic fits of peak over newspapers mm -hmm. scooping an announcement that the White House wanted to make and so on. Again, this is the case against unaccountable bureaucracies. The trick, though, then, is to, is to link that to the issues that usually decide American elections. And those issues are questions of where is the economy going? You know, what are my costs? What is the cost of health care doing here? What is the cost of education doing there? And so on. And that's where, and I, I agree with Charles, there was an, a huge opportunity. And you know, and some ball fumbling. And it was also just the politicians who were best suited to make that argument opted out of running for president. I mean, this is right. I mean, that's just part of anyone from a Mitch Daniels on the technocratic side to a Mike Huckabee on the populist side would have been better at that marriage, I think, than, than Romney ultimately was. But Charles, is it all about finding the right politician to voice these arguments? Or is there something that's more fundamental that's needed, for example, in the American educational system uh, to equip citizens to be receptive uh, to these ideas? Well, it used to be, I mean, I, uh, the educational system is an enormous problem. But it's also the case that in the old days, um, the, the job of the conservative movement, in a way, was to educate politicians. I mean, it was to prepare them uh, for the debates by teaching them what the issues were. And I think the conservative movement does that less well than it used to do, partly because they, the movement itself has become more fragmented and more focused on policy questions, discrete areas of public policy, rather than on what's at stake in the largest sense. Um, conservatism maybe was more apocalyptic in the old days, warning, but of course we faced a kind of apocalyptic enemy in international communism. Um, and we have, we've lost that, I think conservatism has lost that sense of uh, of, uh, of defining a big picture for American citizens and, and, and politicians uh, in which uh, they can understand their own part in the history of America and in the, um, the purpose of America, the mission of America, uh, and see that, see that that is threatened by the modern state, by modern liberalism. Um, the policy issues, even on economic policy, tend to drain any sense of, or at least drain a lot of the sense of moral urgency um, out of politics. And that's bad for conservatism, I think. But it's also the case, as you say, that you have the, you face <clears throat> an, an almost intractable problem, especially in higher education in the country. Um, I mean, Bill Buckley's God and Man at Yale came out more than 60 years ago uh, in 1951. 
And uh, as, as Ross can, can testify from his own uh, book on h higher education at Harvard, the situation has not gotten any better, um, except in very small and discrete ways. But it, generally, the, it, the university is much more politically correct, much more ideological, much more univocal than it was in the 1950s or the 1960s. And, uh, and the unfortunate thing, discussed, by the way, in the, in the cur current issue, the <laughs> forthcoming issue of the Claremont Review of Books, um, is not so much why the conservative critique of the university has failed to move the university. That's, we, we understand that because there are no conservatives in the university. Um, but the, the larger and more mysterious question is why it has not moved the market for higher education. Why um, parents and students and donors have not demanded change uh, and solutions to the problems that for 60 years we've been talking about. Well, maybe we need a tea party for higher ed, but I think that's a good place to stop because please let's thank all of our, our panelists. Thank you.